Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. Back with another case study today, and many of you have been asking for this one for quite a while now, so we're going to do this one today. And that is the infamous El Reno, Oklahoma tornado from May 31st, 2013. One of the most notable, one of the most studied tornadoes of all time. Unfortunately well known because of the fatalities it caused, particularly those of the Twist X crew, Tim Samaras, Paul Samaras, and Carl Young. Um, as you can see here from this incredible photo from Simon Brewer, was just an absolutely massive, beastly tornado. And as usual, we're going to go through the meteorology behind this particular setup. But then we're going to go into kind of the storm and tornado behavior. We don't really do a whole lot of that on this channel. I like to focus on the actual forecasting side of things. But this tornado was so interesting. And there's so many different facets of it, of the actual behavior of the tornado uh, that I think are worth studying that we're going to dive into that. This may be a little bit longer of a case study, but as always, I'm going to have a table of contents um, in the description below, and you should see the different sections of the video come up on the timeline at the bottom of the video. Um, so go ahead and feel free to skip around if you'd like, but this is going to be a, 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 an interesting case study for sure on one of the more uh, unique tornadoes of all time. Just an absolutely incredible shot here from Simon Brewer at its when the tornado was near, near its peak uh, intensity and another shot here from my friend Brett Wright uh, as it, the tornado was first beginning very stout tornado there just a beastly looking storm uh, from all facets so let's go ahead and get started here we're going to take a look at some context here just as we usually do just kind of start things off this is the day one the initial day one outlook from the SPC on the morning of May 31st started out as a moderate risk centered on central Oklahoma up into northeast Oklahoma far southwest Missouri with a broad slight risk surrounding that all hazards threat was on the table, including the threat for strong tornadoes from central Oklahoma up toward northeast Oklahoma with a large hail and damaging wind threat. Large hail threat was also expected to be pretty significant there. A 45 hashed area was introduced there at the 13Z outlook. But the uh, 1630 outlook actually introduced a 15 hashed area for tornadoes extending up within that moderate risk area from southern uh, south central Oklahoma up through the moderate risk area into southwest Missouri. Uh, as well as a significant wind threat, wind contour added uh, with the large hail threat as well. And they also actually considered upgrading to a high risk at 20Z um, if the trends were conti would continue. They did not end up uh, going to a high risk, but the significant tornado threat remained there, 15 hatched, with a 60% hatched large hail threat uh, risk area added there in central to northern Oklahoma. We're going to talk about the hail threat with this storm as well. So let's go ahead and dive into the meteorology here. We'll start off with our 500 millibar map, as we usually do. And the first thing you can see right off the bat is that our, our main 500 millibar trough, our closed low up here, is centered well off toward the north in across the Dakota's vicinity. Strong belt of flow rounding the base of that trough across the central to the southern plains. But again, we're kind of well removed from the trough. So at first glance, this doesn't really look like a typical severe weather setup. The exit region of the main trough up here into the upper Midwest and Great Lakes vicinity. And we're kind of situated down in here, kind of away from the main sort of forcing with this trough. But it gets a little bit more interesting as we go down to 700 millibars. And again, this, this trough would kind of just sit there and meander. And as a result, Oklahoma and the kind of overall moderate risk area was kind of just in this in the southern edge of this belt of enhanced flow aloft away from the main forcing associated with the trough. But again, at 700 millibars, things got a little bit more interesting. Take a, Keep your eyes on the Texas Panhandle. Here's I go forward in time. Take a look at this little kink here in the flow. This is a shortwave trough here. And as we know, we use 700 millibar maps to determine where shortwaves are. And you can see a bunch of different shortwaves rotating around the base of this main trough, which again, centered across the Dakota's vicinity. You can see a number of different shortwaves in here. But this one across the Texas Panhandle to the Texas South Plains was of most concern for the upcoming severe weather event on the afternoon of May 31st. As this was expected to kind of rotate through into central Oklahoma by mid to late afternoon. And you can see it kind of just kind of meanders there. By 21Z, 4 p.m., you can see a little bit of that kink there evident in the um, height contours there approaching central Oklahoma, and this was just before storm initiation. So this shortwave there was just enough. Again, it's a very subtle sort of forcing mechanism here away from the main forcing associated with this trough, just enough to initiate some uh, you know, sort of widely scattered storms there along the dry line across west central Oklahoma. 850 millibars here. We'll take a look at our low-level jet. You can see we start the day with a sort of broad low-level jet here centered across central Oklahoma down into Texas 
up through Kansas and Missouri, broad area of you know 30 to 40, 45 knots, even 50 knots up here in southeast Kansas, southwest Missouri, in the morning hours. So broad low level, low level jet across the region to start the day. But as we went into the afternoon hours, you can see what happens to the low level jet. This is at 19Z, so early afternoon, about uh, 2 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Notice what's happened to the low-level jet here across central Oklahoma. We've decreased pretty significantly to about 20 to 30 knots across the area. And you know, Usually with severe weather events, we like to see that low-level jet fairly strong as that will continue to pump that moisture, that moist air mass in the low levels northward into the region. And it will also increase the wind shear for significant severe weather in a given setup. We're only seeing 20 to 30 knots. We're going to take a look at the um, soundings here in our, the, our photographs in a second. But the photographs and the low-level shear remained fairly weak throughout much of the day. But the low-level jet was expected to ramp up as we went into as we went kind of closer to sunset. That's kind of exactly what happened here. You can see by zero Z, we kind of ramped that up to 30, 35 knots here across the region. We're again going to take a look at the photographs in a second. So as we went through the afternoon, the the overall profiles didn't really start out looking, you know, as um, significant for you know strong tornadoes. But as we went into the evening hours, they certainly changed. And as we know, with the result of this event, uh, that, that we certainly did get significant tornadoes from this particular setup. So let's go down and look at the, the uh, surface map here. We'll start off on our mesoanalysis and take a look at this very strong low across northern South Dakota. So one thing, of course, we can tell is that this trough was kind of vertically stacked. Uh, we like to see for a maturing trough, the trough kind of tilts backward. The center of low pressure as we go up in the atmosphere kind of tilts backward with height. And that's the, the hallmark of a strong or maturing sort of trough. But this particular trough was kind of vertically stacked. The center of low pressure, as we, if we recall at 500 millibars, was kind of centered right over this exact area. Same thing at 700 and 850 millibars. So this was a vertically stacked system, kind of occluding and ejecting off into the northern plains into Canada. But a very strong surface low here at this point, 990 millibar low centered across northern South Dakota with a cold front draped across the central plains down into Kansas and Oklahoma. And with sort of a broad sort of cyclonic circulation that was expected to intensify as we went into the afternoon hours here across uh, northwest Texas. You can see as we go on with time there, that front kind of sags into northern Oklahoma. And we get very significant sort of surface load development there in northwest Texas. You can see that surface load developing there in kind of the Childress to Vernon area, and our front kind of drapes somewhere out across sort of north central Oklahoma up into Kansas and up into the northern plains. It's that low just kind of sat there in kind of the Dakotas region. So let's go on to our actual surface data here. We'll start off at 12Z, just after 12Z here. You can see we already have a very juicy air mass in place, 70s dew points across much of Oklahoma. Uh, with kind of you know upper 60s to 70s down there across the Red River. So very juicy air mass already in the morning hours here across Oklahoma. You can, we can kind of see where that cold front is. It's a little bit of a sort of diffuse front, if you will, but you can generally see a wind shift here. Winds over Nebraska, western Kansas out of the west or northwest there with winds across Oklahoma into Missouri out of the south or southeast. So the front was kind of generally in this sort of area. Um, it's kind of a little bit difficult to tell, but the front kind of drapes somewhere in that area. And it was expected to sag just a little bit into northern Oklahoma as we went into the afternoon. But as that surface low developed in northwest Texas near Childress, that would allow the surface winds to kind of strengthen and back out of the southeast and kind of allow that front to stall out a little bit across north central uh, Oklahoma, somewhere in that vicinity, in the vicinity of the I-40 corridor. And you, we can see as we go on with time here, that's exactly what happens. As we go on through the day, notice that surface winds are kind of somewhat south-southwesterly actually here. They're a little bit veered in the low levels. Again, we were still waiting for that surface load to kind of take shape there across northwest Texas. And as we went on with time, those surface winds definitely did start backing as we went into the mid to late afternoon hours. Here, this is at 4 p.m. Central Daylight Time. You can see very juicy air mass across the region, 89 over 72, 86 over 74 there at OKC. Very hot temperatures out here across northwest Texas into southwest Oklahoma. So that was allowing for um, that dry line to set up as those surface winds started to back and strengthen out of the south-southeast there. Our front located somewhere in this vicinity. You can kind of see it's sharpened a little bit out here across northern Oklahoma, but the wind shift definitely somewhere in here. You can see it sets up right there just north of the I-40 corridor with a, an associated dry line out here across southwest Oklahoma. You can see dew points 57 there at this particular station, 74 at OKC, 
60 out here at Hobart with 72 degree dew point there at Fort Sill. So our dry line located somewhere in here. And that was creating what is known as a triple point. Triple point is where that dry line and surface front kind of meet there. And, that, and that's exactly what was setting up there across west central Oklahoma. Kind of near the Clinton Weatherford area, just off toward the north of there in that general vicinity by mid to late afternoon. And that would be enough, there would be enough convergence right at that sort of triple point area for some storms to fire there uh, by about 4.30 p.m. or so on May 31st. We also had some storms farther down south along the dry line, but a little less forcing there, a little bit more diffuse, a little bit less convergence there along the dry line. Hotter temperatures there uh, was allowing those storms to be a little bit high based. More so, those were hailers down there uh, near Lawton, in the general vicinity of Lawton. Uh, but our main show, of course, was going to be along the triple point and along the surface front. The surface front uh, sort of had become stationary by this point, and that was uh, the enough convergence along this boundary to allow some storm development there just toward the uh, northern Oklahoma into southeast Kansas region. A little bit closer look here as we zoom in on Oklahoma, and you can, we can really start to pinpoint where those fronts are. You can see that wind shift there across kind of northwest to northern Oklahoma, um, winds out of the northeast, north of the boundary, out of the south or south, southeast, south of the boundary. And we can really pinpoint where that dry line is uh, somewhere in kind of this vicinity here. You can see the winds out of the southeast here, dew points in the upper 60s to low 70s with dew points in the 50s to low 60s there and winds out of the southwest to the west of that boundary. So our triple point was definitely setting up somewhere in here. Here's OKC, El Reno, kind of right in this vicinity here. So storms were expected to fire just out toward the west uh, near the I-40 corridor um, there to the west of OKC by mid-afternoon. So here's our satellite view, visible satellite imagery starting in the early morning hours. And you can really see we were from the get-go a starting to ripen that atmosphere. Very much um, quite a bit of solar heating, um, surface heating here across the region with just some, you know, generally broken cloud cover there across the region. You can see those, if we zoom in here a little bit, you can see some cloud streets there. It was a little bit of sort of banding in the um, low level clouds there, indicating some stability. We did start off the day with um, a capping inversion in place. We'll take a look at the soundings here in a second. And we go on with time. You can see that the cumulus ahead of that dry line south of the cold front becomes much more numerous by the afternoon. This is just after lunchtime here. So already getting a very ripe atmosphere for, for severe storm development here. Near those boundaries by mid afternoon, by early afternoon or so, we go on, we continue to go on with time. You can actually see where those boundaries are. You can see the dry line there um, denoted by the cumulus boundary and the cold front kind of, their stationary front kind of situated somewhere along there. Storms firing already in Southeast Kansas at this time, which was about uh, 3 p.m. or so and those would continue to get to get agitated right at that triple point and we would eventually get storms to fire right at that triple point as convective temperatures were breached uh, right there um, in west central oklahoma by about 4 30 p.m or so so let's do some sounding analysis now we'll start off here with our observed sounding at norman from 12z on may 31st and this is a pretty classic loaded gun sort of sounding that you typically see on a significant severe weather day First thing of note, very stout elevated mixed layer in place here, very deep elevated mixed layer in place. And if we talk about this ad nauseum on these videos here, the elevated mixed layer or EML is that layer of warm, drier air just above the surface um, that emanates from the desert southwest or western Mexico. And as those mid-level winds out of the southwest start to um, impinge into the region, uh, they start bringing that elevated mixed layer out across the plains and that allows moisture to build beneath it. That allows the um, atmosphere to remain capped for much of the day until the main forcing arrives and erodes that cap. And we build explosive instability in the process. You can see already here at 12Z, experiencing over 3,000 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape at Norman here. So a very unstable atmosphere taking shape already in the morning hours here. And that elevated mixed layer would only serve to keep the um, keep the environment free and clear from any storms throughout the afternoon. And uh, that would lead to explosive storm development along that triple point as we went into the afternoon. Moist layer here, not particularly deep, still surface moisture very, very good, 75 over 72 here at Norman. But the overall mixed uh, moist layer doesn't extend too deep into the atmosphere, only up to about 875, 900 millibars or so. So not a, a significantly deep uh, moist layer there. Photograph here, 
Very strong veering winds with height. As you, you recall, that low-level jet was in place as we started the morning out here. Eight, uh, 850 millibar winds out of the southwest at about 50 knots or so. So very strong warm invection, very strong curvature in that hodograph already going into the morning hours. But as we went into the afternoon, that would decrease quite a bit. Of course, we did look at our 850 millibar map showing that axis of the, of the axis of the low level jet moving off toward the east quite a bit there as we went into the afternoon. This is at Norman 18Z. Elevated mix layer still holding tight there. Very strong elevated mix layer. And, and this is about as textbook as it gets on a significant severe weather setup as far as the thermodynamics go. Elevated mix layer holding in place. Very deep elevated mix layer there. Very strong instability mix layer cape approaching 4,000 joules per kilogram already there. With our moist layer deepening, 84, 83 over 74 at the surface, that moist layer extending up past 850 millibars here. So a very moist low-level atmosphere beneath that capping inversion with a very ex extremely unstable atmosphere was setting the stage for a significant severe weather event. So now let's take a look at some rap soundings. It's a little bit more, um, a little bit more high resolution in time here, so we can kind of see how the overall sounding changes at time. This is at KOKC, so Will Rogers Airport there in Oklahoma City, just east of El Reno. Uh, and we can see how the atmosphere changes with time. So as we saw in tw the 12Z observed sounding, very stout elevated mix layer in place uh, with a very strong uh, kind of veering winds there in the low levels. Those would decrease as we went into the afternoon hours. You can see as we go on with time here at 18Z, that elevated mix layer again, uh, staying, uh, holding tight, deep, uh, fairly deep, somewhat deep uh, moist layer there at OKC. But our hodograph here, our low level hodograph had decreased very significantly by this time, effective inflow layer SRH only uh, you know sub 100 meters squared per second squared at this point. So, just at this point, the overall wind profile was not favorable for significant tornadic supercells uh, right now. But again, that was going to change as we went into the afternoon. You'll see a very slow enlargement of those low-level hodographs here. This is at 22Z at KOKC 88 over 74. Very juicy low levels there. Deep moist layer extending up above 850 millibars, and we had completely eroded that cap. This particular model sounding showing over 5,000 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cape. Not sure we actually got there. Uh, maybe we're hanging out in the mid 4,000s or so, but still, that is extreme instability. And even with this sort of weak low-level shear, as storms started to fire, they were able to um, you know, start producing low-level mesocyclones even before that low-level jet really started to ramp up because of that very strong low-level cape. Zero to three kilometer instability there of Almost 200 joules per kilogram there. You can see very strong low-level instability. So that's what happens in these high cape, low shear scenarios. And that's why kind of I always say that the rules kind of go out the window when we start seeing these high cape, low shear type scenarios. And we've seen it in many other scenarios. We just did a case study a few weeks back on the Gerald, Texas 1997 F5 tornado. Similar situation. A little much more shear in this particular case. So supercells were a likelihood. Deep layer shear approaching 50 knots there. So supercells were a pretty good likelihood, but significant tornadic supercells were still in play. You know, of course, they did happen in the Gerald case, but significant tornadic supercells in play in both of those cases because of this strong low-level instability. Three cape approaching 200 joules per kilogram there, and that is going to really efficiently tilt and stretch any spin you have in the low levels, any low-level shear or spin into the vertical to help aid in tornado genesis, and that was definitely an aiding factor with this particular case as well. So 22Z, 23Z, as the storms were ongoing, you can see that a slow increase in that low-level hodograph there. This is at 6 p.m. as the El Reno tornado was about to uh, touch down. Very strong shear, deep layer shear, and our low-level shear definitely increasing with time, 264 meters squared per second squared. So overall, the low-level jet was at this point increasing very rapidly. So we were kind of in that sweet spot. Storms were firing right as that low-level jet was really ramping up. And as that low-level jet really ramped up there between 6 and 7 p.m., we were able to get um, a very strong, significant to violent tornado out of this supercell. This is at KOKC at 0Z. We'll go to OUN, a little bit farther removed from the overall um, convection here. You can see these red bars here. A little bit of convective contamination there. And this is at 0Z, so as that storm was moving into the OKC metro, you can see by this point, very strong low-level shear over 350 meters squared per second squared of effective storm relative helicity there. So given the strong instability in place, very strong low, low level shear at this point was definitely at this time a recipe for significant tornadoes with this uh, event. Let's take a look at the overall um, sort of 
uh, kind of storm forecast storm behavior with this particular setup. So we'll go back to our 22Z hodograph uh, and, and skew T here. So large hail, you can, if we recall, they upgraded to a 60% hatched area for large hail in the afternoon, afternoon hours on the um, 31st. And we can see exactly why here. We've noticed from recent research, it was, as we've talked about in some previous videos, that we want weaker low-level shear for significant hail producing storms. And that's exactly what we had here. Even though the low level jet was, was to increase over the next several hours, we started off as those storms initiated with relatively muted low level shear. And that amid strong deep layer shear for supercells with very strong instability there was a recipe for you know very large to giant hail. And that's exactly what we got. We got you know very large hail out of these supercells across central to northern Oklahoma because we started off with very strong shear. Now, as we moved into the evening hours, as that storm was ongoing, the low level shear ramped up pretty significantly. And therefore, even though we had very strong instability, very steep lapse rates there in the mid levels, our low level shear was much, much stronger now. So the overall threat went from mostly a large hail threat early on to a significant tornado threat as that low level shear ramped up. Now let's take a look at our 23Z wrap proximity sounding here and take a look at for our supercell type, our possible supercell type here. And the first thing we notice is that our storm relative, our storm relative winds in the mid-levels are fairly weak. You can see the distance between the storm motion vector, our bunker's right storm motion vector, and the hodograph fairly weak in the mid-levels. That means the precipitation not going to be vented off away from the mesocyclone region with these storms. We typically like to see the mid-level winds kind of back away from the low-level hodograph there to help vent that precipitation off away from the mesocyclone region of the storm. That makes the storms a lot more, you know, a lot more easy to chase, a lot more easy to spot. The tornadoes are much more visible because of that. Well, in this case, the holograph, the holograph here, you'll notice kind of folds back over on itself here. So the precipitation was going to be vented kind of out in front of the ongoing tornado here. So because we had very weak storm relative outflow, again, very weaker sort of storm relative winds there in the mid-levels, we were looking at more of a high precipitation storm mode, and that's exactly what we got. You can see, you've seen, I'm sure, plenty of pictures from this particular event. You know, we'll go back here. You can see at this point it was quite visible, but a lot of rain getting wrapped around this circulation, and it, uh, you know, there were many times where this uh, tornado was quite rain-wrapped here, and we'll show this video in a second, but very rain-wrapped circulation here because of that, those weak sort of storm relative winds. So just from a pattern recognition standpoint, this was a setup that we'd kind of seen before. If you recall in our Joplin case study back several weeks ago, we looked at this paper by John Davies in 2017 on the Joplin event. And he actually found that this particular setup that produced the Joplin event was a fairly common one across the Southern Plains for significant tornadoes. And we'll zoom into his figure 13 here. And you can see exactly what happens. We have a main sort of surface low up here located well off toward the north with a cold front draped down to the south from that main surface low. That leads to either a secondary surface low along the frontal zone or some sort of triple point. And that can be, as we see in the El Reno case, a dry line uh, intersecting a stationary or cold front there, in this case in north, what, northwest Oklahoma. And so, and the favored location for significant tornadoes is either right ahead of that surface low or triple point. And that's exactly what happened with the Joplin case and several other cases, including the El Reno case in 2013. So this was, again, a setup that we'd seen before and one that does often tend to produce significant tornadoes in these kind of these secondary surface low sort of cases. So let's kind of look at the progression of the event on radar here. We start out at 4 p.m. Central Daylight Time. You can see storms had already begun to fire along the stationary front up in northern Oklahoma to southeast Kansas, but we're still waiting for development along the dry line here in western Oklahoma. But eventually, around 4.30 p.m. or so, we get our first blips here to go up near the Weatherford and Clinton area there west of El Reno, right ahead of that triple point. And with the robust instability in place and the strong deep layer shear, these quickly became supercells here. Didn't take long for these to intensify into supercells. And we eventually kind of had a sort of broken line of semi-discrete storms there, with our greatest concern being this one along the southern flank of the line. And we'll just kind of zoom in here using our radar scope data, much uh, higher resolution data, data here. And actually what happened is this El Reno, eventual El Reno storm underwent a storm merger. And so you can see what happens here. Little storm fires up 
just to the south of the main supercell along I-40, moving off toward the northeast, whereas this storm is moving off kind of due east. So we were bound to have a storm merger take place here, and that's exactly what happened prior to tornado genesis here. You can see as that merger happens, the low-level mesocyclone uh, starts to ramp up pretty significantly there southwest of Calumet, and eventually we that merger completes. We get a brief tornado here just before 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time there southwest, well southwest of El Reno, before the, the main show occurred. That merger was complete, and we get our strong tornado to begin there southwest of El, south southwest of El Reno, northwest of Union City, and that, this was our main El Reno tornado here. You can see what happens as well with the overall storm. It kind of breaks away from the line to its north. So we go on with time here in our zoomed out reflectivity. You can see we kind of have just this bro this kind of broken line here, just kind of semi-discrete elements within that line, but kind of uh, you know not as discrete as what was expected with this particular setup. We go back to our um, storm motion vectors here. Let's quickly look at that. So we know our dry line oriented to the, uh, kind of north-south there. Um, zero to six kilometer shear vectors, pretty much perpendicular to that boundary here. So our dry line oriented somewhat like this, and you can see our shear vectors oriented almost purely perpendicular to that line. So storm splits were somewhat of a concern, perhaps destructive interference there, but overall a discrete storm mode was likely uh, to start this particular event. And that's exactly what happened. Our El Reno storm with time actually broke away from the main line of convection to its north. You can see the main line of storms there along the front to its north and the El Reno storm all by its lonesome there to the south, breaking away from the main line uh, as time progressed there um, and the tornado was in progress. So tornado in progress here. You can see the tornado starts off as a multi-vortex tornado there west of or southwest of El Reno. Lots of different vortices in there and that would be its uh, characteristic for quite a while would form into kind of a wedge, fairly quickly, fairly large tornado with some satellite vortices. We'll talk about the satellite vortex uh, in the second. In a second here, you can see uh, that satellite vortex rotating around the main parent tornado. And eventually it would turn into a very large tornado with a, a very stout interior or sub vortex. And we'll talk about the sub vortex structure and the multiple vortex structure of this tornado as well uh, coming up in a little bit. Some incredible footage here of that interior sub-vortex within that main sort of circulation that you can see is almost entirely rain-wrapped there, um, and then eventually turn into a pretty stout wedge. Of course, we know this was the widest tornado on record, 2.6 miles wide, uh, as it moved past Highway 81 there in, um, you know, south of El Reno. Turns into just an absolute beast uh, of a tornado there. Here is the path of the tornado. So it starts out moving toward the southwest. We'll talk about the motion of the storm in a second as well. Starts out moving toward the southwest, expands here as it crosses Highway 81, its widest point somewhere in here, just after it crosses Highway 81 there, south of El Reno. Turns back toward the northeast, does kind of a loop along I-40, and then eventually dissipates around 6.42 p.m. Um, from uh, its start at about 6.03 p.m. there. Um, so a very, very long track, uh, strong tornado. And eventually what happens is that El Reno storm, the El Reno tornado occludes after quite a, um, quite an extensive sort of path uh, of destruction. So quite, a, quite an extensive path. And then eventually we get lots of storms to fire out to the west of the supercell, kind of on its western flank. And eventually this was still quite discreet with time. We'll go to our kind of second half of the animation here. So ongoing El Reno tornado. And what happens here, the tornado occludes. We eventually get a new tornado genesis here um, at, in western portions of the Oklahoma City metro area. But this would eventually turn into a flash flooding threat as we continue to get training storms here over the Oklahoma City metro area and eventually destructive interference here from the overall storms that continue to train and back build to the west um, along uh, the western flank of the main supercell. We'll talk about that more so at the end of the video, but a very unique progression to this event. Uh, and you can see just from this data, just from the data here, how strong this tornado was. And unfortunately, this is folded uh, aliased data, so not the cleanest, but still you can see just how strong this, uh, this particular circulation was. So that's going to do it for the meteorology portion of this case study. Now let's dive into the tornado and supercell behavior. We're going to take a look at some of the mechanics and the behavior of this particular tornado. Now I'm going to be mentioning a lot of different articles, peer-reviewed articles, in this discussion. I'm going to put all the links to these articles in the description box below. So let's first talk about the tornado genesis within this supercell. 
Now, typically for decades, the um, tornadoes were thought to begin aloft and work downward with time. So let me get a um, screen here up for you and kind of describe that for you in a visual sense. So typically, let's say we have our supercell here, a very crude drawing of a supercell. But so let's say this is a our supercell. The what was uh, believed to be the case in tornado genesis was that the rotation would first strengthen aloft and then work downward with time, and that makes a lot of sense because usually you see a tornado start as a funnel cloud and work downward uh, with time before and until it becomes fully condensed. Well, there's been some research in recent years that shows that this may actually not be the case, that the, the actual vortex may actually begin near the surface and work upward with time beneath that mesocyclone. And this El Reno tornado was actually one of those cases where the latter appears to be true. So this is a figure from Bluestein et al. 2019. And this is a graph of pseudo-vorticity with respect to time and height. So this is time on the x-axis here, starting at 6 p.m., going to 6.06 .06 p.m., so capturing tornado genesis here between about 6.03 and 6.04 p.m. And this is going to be height above ground level on the y-axis, starting at the surface uh, at the bottom, going to about 4 kilometers aloft here at the top of the graph. And all of these uh, contours here are a measure of pseudo-vorticity. And pseudo-vorticity, we know what vorticity is, it's basically a, a measure of spin in the atmosphere. And pseudo-vorticity is basically a proxy where we can kind of estimate the strength of the spin within a vortex signature based on mobile radar. And based on some peer-reviewed research, the way we can do that, we can measure pseudo-vorticity, uh, is pseudo-vorticity is the calculation where we do, we multiply delta V max by two over D. And let me kind of break this down for you. So delta V max is the uh, sum of the maximum inbound and maximum outbound parcel, uh, pixel within a particular velocity couplet. So if we were to look, and just for example, let me pick a random couplet in here. So this is our, our couplet. And let's say our outbound par uh, pixels, which are going uh, obviously away from the radar here, these reds, and the greens are our inbound pixels. So let's say we have a maximum outbound pixel of, let's just say, 40 meters per second. And let's say our maximum inbound pixel within the greens here is, let's say, 35 meters per second. And obviously this is not correct, and we have some aliasing issues here, so this red right in here would actually be green if we were to, to unfold it. But, you know, just for argument's sake, let's say we have an, a maximum outbound part pixel of 40 meters per second and a maximum inbound pixel of 35 meters per second. So the outbounds would be negative 40 because they're going away from the radar. So we, we would just add the absolute value of those two. So 40, we would lock, out, lock off the negative, plus 35 equals 75 meters per second. That would be our delta V max for this particular example. So that is our delta V max within our pseudo-vorticity equation. 2 delta V max over D. And D is the distance between those two pixels. So if we had those two pixels, for example, here and here, for let's say, th that's, this was our maximum outbound, maximum inbound, the distance between those two would be our uh, D value. So, you know, for example, let's say it's two kilometers, and let's say our, you know, delta V max is 75 meters per second. We do some decimal calculations, and we'd come up, decimal movement within those numbers, get the um, units correct, and we would come up with pseudo-vorticity, basically a way to estimate the overall strength of the spin within a vortex signature. So this is a graph of that pseudo-vorticity with time and height during tornado, tornado genesis of the El Reno 2013 tornado. And notice here we have a bunch of different, bunch of blues here as we go on with time. And then just after 2303, 603 p.m., we start to see a very stark increase in pseudo-vorticity here in the low levels. And you can see that the upper levels kind of stay the same. We see those kind of blues there up in the upper levels while this low-level pseudo-vorticity near the surface starts to increase. And then eventually, it starts to build upward with time. We start to get those greens up here moving upward with time. And that occurs after this low-level pseudo-vorticity increases. So it appears that this El Reno tornado actually began near the, the ground. The vortex signature first strengthened near the surface and then worked upward with time. And again, that is in contrast to a lot of the findings back from the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, 
where it was apparent, where it seemed that the tornado would actually, the vortex would, it would increase in strength aloft and then work downward with time. And we're actually seeing some more cases in recent years where this upward tornado genesis or non-descending tornado genesis is the case. And that could be just a function of the increase in overall mobile radar deployments in the last several years, last couple decades. Um, but we're seeing more and more cases where that non-descending or ascending tornado genesis is the case. Here's an example from the Elmer, Oklahoma tornado on May 16th, 2015. This is a similar graph, and this is showing delta V max with time and height. So the strength of the uh, vortex signature, uh, in essence, again, that's delta V max is the sum of the maximum inbound velocity and maximum outbound velocity within a tornado vortex signature. And this was part of my actual master's thesis from back a couple years ago. And you can see here, this is a, again a plot of delta V max with time on the x-axis and height above ground on the y-axis. And you can see as we start going on here, we start to see these light blues and, and kind of turquoise greens increase here in the low levels first. And then eventually it kind of builds upward with time as we go on through the tornado genesis process of the Elmer, Oklahoma tornado. So that was an example where we once again saw non-descending or ascending tornado genesis. And these next couple cases are from a French et al. 2013 paper that went over, uh, kind of re-examined this concept and showing that there have been numerous cases where non-descending tornado genesis is the preferred tornado genesis mechanism within supercells. This is the Goshen County, Wyoming tornadic supercell that was probably the most fruitful case from the uh, Vortex 2 project back in 2009-2010. Uh, and this was a very well-probed tornado by uh, mobile radars, mesonets, etc. And this is a graph of basically just our baseline uh, uh, vortex signature characteristics with time and height. So basically the same thing we're looking at, but this is ba basically just showing these dots are when the criteria are met. And those criteria, uh, based on some peer-reviewed research in the past, for a tornado, for a vortex signature to be considered a tornado, delta V max has to be greater than or equal to 40 meters per second. And that can be debated a little bit, it can be a little bit less based on you know, the characteristics of the radar, et cetera. But delta V max greater than or equal to 40 meters per second, I believe in this case, it was either 25 or 30 meters per second. And D had to be less than or equal to two kilometers. So basically a delta V max, the, the strength of the velocity in that uh, vortex signature, signature has to be greater than 30 meters per second. And the width of that vortex uh, signature has to be less than two kilometers for it to be considered a tornado vortex signature. So basically these dots again are plotting when those criteria were met in the Goshen County, Wyoming data set. And you can see here, we start at the surface, we start to see the TVS and then it starts to build upward as we go on with time. And our last case from that French et al. 2013 paper is the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado from May 24th, 2011. This is showing the um, mobile radar data, the RAX poll data from that particular event. And so, so this first, Row here is at the one degree elevation scan, so our low level scan. Then we go up with, with in height, 10 degrees scan, so mid levels, 25 degrees and 40 degrees. So we're going up in the actual vortex signature as we go down here in the rows in this particular figure. And you notice here that this is at 204930, 204941, 204952, 2050 So you can see we're going with time, increasing time this way. And so we start to see a vortex signature take shape well before we see that upper level vortex signature take shape. You can see it here at 25 degrees, just a broad sort of shear signature, not really, you know, uh, not really indicative of a tight vortex signature, but here several uh, seconds after the low level um, mesocyclone or low level vortex signature strengthens, we start to see the strengthening of that upper level vortex signature in the upper levels of, of that data. So this is this El Reno case was kind of a, a no, just another case to add to the bucket where we're starting to see that tornado genesis perhaps does begin in the low levels with time, low levels, and then in, um, increases uh, with height as you go on with time during a tornado, tornado genesis process. And in my thesis, um, you know, as we discussed, saw the Elmore, tor Elmore tornado do that. Also saw some other tornadoes that did not did not follow this ascending tornado genesis mechanism. So lots of further research is going to be needed with this, with this uh, concept, but at least for this El Reno 2013 case, the ascending tornado genesis was the preferred tornado genesis mechanism. Now let's have a quick discussion about the satellite vortex that formed here 
just uh, a few minutes after the tornado genesis process occurred. This is some video from the Dominator with Reed Timmer. This was taken by Ray Bohack, who was sitting in the Dominator as well. You can see the main tornado, very large at this point. Notice if we look off toward the right, there is a pretty large vortex here that appears to be orbiting around the main tornado. Let me back it up just a second there. Very well-defined vortex. I believe this is the actual satellite vortex. Again, there were multiple sub-vortices within this, and, and the difference between a satellite vortex and a sub-vortex is that the satellite vortex is a separate tornado rotating outside and around of the main circulation, whereas a sub-vortex rotates within the parent tornadic circulation and orbits around the circulation on the inside of the main tornado. This appears to be the satellite vortex. I'm not 100% sure uh, just from this footage, but this does look like a satellite vortex. And actually, Raxpol, the mobile radar from University of Oklahoma, captured some pretty incredible data of this actual satellite tornado. So here you can see the large mesocyclone of the main vortex, very strong velocity couplet there. And notice at the very tip of the inflow notch here, our inflow notch, those strong winds feeding into the tornadic circulation there. Notice at the tip of that um, of that inflow notch, a weak echo hole develops. You can see right in here in our reflectivity on the left, weak echo region develops with a strong tornadic couplet there. So some very high resolution data of this um, secondary tornado, this satellite vortex orbiting around the main circulation, the main tornado kind of wobbling here, and our satellite vortex orbiting around the main parent circulation until it eventually merges with the main circulation. Here's our last frame that I have here. I wish I had my uh, the full archive of Raxpol data here from this event, but unfortunately lost my access when I uh, uh, after I defended my master's thesis at OU. Um, but nonetheless, you can see very very um, you know if you can call this eye candy of high resolution radar imagery. Very large tornadic circulation here main tornado there and the satellite vortex merging within that parent merging into that parent tornado and then dissipating eventually so very interesting evolution of the of a, a satellite vortex orbiting around the main tornado with the um with this case One of the most notable aspects of the El Reno tornado was its somewhat erratic or deviant motion as you can see here from this uh, damage path map from the NWS Norman, you can see it starts off with a very southerly or southeasterly storm motion, then takes a turn back toward the east, generally following the parent supercell motion, before taking a very harsh turn toward the left or toward the north or northeast. Finally does kind of a loop there just north of I-40 before continuing off toward the east before fully dissipating at 6.42 p.m. So this was a very unique path that this tornado took, and I've heard it uh, especially this quick turn toward the northeast, described as unexpected. And actually, these kind of uh, de this kind of deviant motion can be forecast by looking at the hodograph, and I'll show you that technique in a second. So this turn toward the left or north was not all that unexpected. What was unexpected was at the same time it took that turn toward the north, it accelerated and expanded quite rapidly. Of course, going uh, approaching its maximum width here just east of Highway 81, as it approached that 2.6 mile wide threshold. So let's go ahead and start off with the initial portion of the path here as it was taking that kind of southeasterly motion. This is a figure from Blue Stein et al. 2019, the paper we've been looking at here throughout this video. And let's go ahead and orient you with the figure here. So the red lines, these red curves, are the location of the forward flank downdraft and rear flank downdraft gust fronts. So as we know, we need the forward flank downdraft and the rear flank downdraft to kind of be in balance along with the inflow of a supercell, and the tornado will happen kind of at the interface of those boundaries. These black curves, both the solid curves and the dashed curves, are secondary rear flank downdraft surges. I'll abbreviate that as SRFD surges. And you can think of the rear flank downdraft as a kind of continuous phenomenon. Again, we need that RFD to be strong throughout the life cycle of a tornado for that balance to be struck and that tornado to continue uh, to occur. Well, it's a continuous phenomenon, but it, the intensity of that rear flank downdraft can be different at times. And sometimes you can have little surges in intensity, little upticks in intensity, as that RFD uh, kind of pushes out that gust front out ahead of it. Those are called secondary rear flank downdraft surges, and those can um, modulate the motion of a tornado vortex. 
And finally, the kind of solid line here with these red dots along it is going to be the path of the tornado. Uh, of course, we know that the tornado starts here at about 2303. You can see that first dot there, first jogs to the south uh, between these two frames. So tornado genesis occurs in this frame, and then tornado genesis, tor the tornado is in progress through the remaining frames here. So let's look at the orientation of the secondary rear flank downdraft and the main rear flank rear flank downdraft boundary. So you can see it starts here. And then the rear flank downdraft is pushing out this way quite a bit. And so it's likely that the rear flank downdraft gust front was pushing this tornado off toward the south quite a bit, including these uh, secondary rear flank downdraft surges. You can see they're kind of pushing out here. They're kind of hard to ascertain uh, from just a broad view here, but you can kind of see the slight differences in the uh, tint of the green here. So we go from kind of bluish green as the um, inbounds within the tornado vortex and to kind of lighter green out here. So this is our main secondary rear flank downdraft surge. Then these dashed lines here, you can see just slightly darker green to lighter green out here with this particular boundary. And then one boundary along here. So these dashed lines are gonna be much weaker secondary rear flank downdraft surges. And this the solid line here is going to be your main secondary surge. So this secondary surge, along with the kind of southeasterly motion of the main rear flank downdraft gust front, likely was uh, the culprit for pushing this tornado off toward the south or southeast uh, with time just after it uh, began. Then we go on with time, the rear flank downdraft gust front kind of orients itself moving more off kind of toward an easterly direction with the rear flank downdraft secondary surges moving off toward the eastern northeast as well. So that kind of had the effect of pushing the tornado back off toward the east, kind of following the storm motion. And then we get into the portion of the life cycle where it takes a turn, a harsh turn toward the northeast. And again, we can forecast this using the hode graph. There is has been uh, ample work done by Cameron Nixon and John Allen um, on this topic of deviant tornado motion, how we can use a simple hodograph technique to forecast deviant motion. And they talk about it all in this paper. Again, I'm going to put this in the link in the, the link to this paper in the description below, as well as to a link to Cameron Nixon's website here, where he has a very interesting article on this deviant motion hodograph technique. So real quick, before we get into this deviant motion hodograph technique, let's talk about some of the factors that can influence deviant tornado motion. The first we've already talked about, and that is strong downdrafts. Whether it's the rear flank downdraft or secondary rear flank downdraft surges, these strong downdrafts can push the tornado in directions away from the general motion of the parent supercell, as we've already discussed with the El Reno tornado in the early part of its life cycle. We can also have the tornado orbit around the main mesocyclone. So you have the parent mesocyclone in your tornado here, for example. Well, that tornado can eventually orbit around the mesocyclone, and then we can get some more deviant motions of that actual tornado vortex within the parent mesocyclone. And finally, we can have deviant motion during the occlusion process. And this may be the most common factor that we uh, see with deviant tornado motion. It happens during the occlusion process. And we've talked about the occlusion process before. It's when the tornado gets choked off from the main supply of warm, moist air feeding it. It basically, the rear flank downdraft wraps around the tornado, cuts it off from that, that storm food, if you will, and it detaches from the parent mesocyclone. And because the tornado is not being driven by the parent mesocyclone dynamics after the occlusion occurs, what happens is the tornado then gets pushed, literally pushed by the low level flow, which is generally out of the south or southeast, and it gets pushed off generally toward the north or to the left of the storm of the parent storm motion. And that is, you know, again, most often what we see, I think, with deviant tornado motion is this occlusion process and getting literally pushed by the low level flow. And again, we can actually estimate deviant tornado motion using the hodograph. So the way we do that, again, this technique is in Nixon and Allen 2021. The link is in the description below. The first thing we have to do is to estimate the winds, the average winds in the lowest half kilometer or 500 meters of the atmosphere. So the way we do that, as we know, the hodograph is a bunch of vectors. These points on the hodograph are the actual wind vectors at those given, level, given levels of the atmosphere. So let's draw a couple vectors here. And you can eyeball this when you're doing an analysis on your own, but let's say we draw one, uh, our surface wind there, and one at five, uh, 500 meters right there, which is right there on the hodograph, labeled 0.5, which is 0.5 kilometers. So all we have to do to average these is kind of take uh, the middle of the two tips of these vectors. So it would be somewhere kind of right in here, so to speak. And again, that's just kind of eyeballing it. Um, but you know, we, you, we could do this mathematically, but it would be somewhere kind of right in there. Then 
we have to figure out our storm motion. You want to generally use the observed storm motion, but the bunker's right mover storm motion on the, a forecast photograph is usually good enough. And in this case, our, our right mover supercell, right moving supercell storm motion was 260 degrees at 25 knots or so. So it'd be kind of right in here. You, know, you could say the storm is moving a little bit more toward the east, so you could say something right in there, but generally this is going to be good enough. And then all we do from there is we average those two points. So we just literally go right in the exact middle of those two points, which is going to be right in here. And you draw a vector to that point, and that is your deviant tornado motion. So if we were to assume in this environment that we were going, going to get a deviant tornado, a tornado that would move in a deviant fashion, you would use this storm motion. So if we were to take this um, vector and kind of look at our um, tornado path map, you would see that generally it's going to follow that vector. So we basically were able to forecast our deviant motion. So this turn toward the northeast was not all that, you know, shouldn't have all been that unexpected. Now what was unexpected again was the acceleration of the t tornado at this time, as well as the widening, the rapid uh, expansion of the tornado's size during this time frame. So, you know, and, and I'm not 100% sure why we saw this rapid expansion and rapid, you know, wide uh, acceleration of the tornado. You know, you could think you know, perhaps it is some sort of RFD surge that is really pushing the tornado along because our deviant tornado motion was not all that fast here. You can see it's at 231 degrees at 13 knots. So 13 knots is not all that fast at all. And we saw the tornado actually, you know, accelerate to a forward speed of something like you know 40 to 50 miles an hour. So it could be something like another a rear flank downdraft surge that pushed this tornado along at the same time it made that turn to the north. Um, but it, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you. But nonetheless, it made this turn to the north while, accel while accelerating, while widening, and it caught a lot of people off guard here to the east of Highway 281. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. So this kind of so that is a way we were able to forecast the deviant storm motion, deviant tornado motion for this supercell, and this is generally fairly accurate within about six knots or so. And this kind of deviant motion is more likely with slower storm motions. Usually, you know, deviant storm motion is a perceived motion. It's perceived, you know, you're an observer on the ground, you're watching the tornado, you know, if it's coming at you, moving with the storm, it's not, it's not deviant at that point, but if it starts moving off, say, to your significantly to your left or to the north of your location, you're going to, going to perceive that as a deviant tornado motion. So these generally tend to happen with a slower storm speed because, you know, if the tornado is moving really fast, it's, it's not going to be, you know, deviating from your perspective as much as if it were moving really slowly, where it would take a very um, a harsh turn perhaps out uh, to the left of the general parent supercell motion. And another thing to remember, the atmosphere likes to be in balance, and that is the same with tornadoes as well. And the more that the tornado initially deviates to the right, which is not an uncommon thing at all, but the more it deviates to the right, uh, the more it's going to have to deviate back to the left to make up for that distance that it traveled away to the right of the storm motion. So you know, this tornado was very, very likely to turn significantly back off toward the north because it moved so far south and southeast in the initial portion of its life cycle. Now, there were other um, things at play as well. The interesting thing here that is that the usually this, you know, stark leftward motion occurs with the occlusion process uh, in the supercell. After the tornado occludes, it often will, again, get pushed by that strong low-level flow off toward the north or to the left of the storm motion. But again, here, as we saw this, you know, turn toward the north, it began to widen and we were able to, um, the mobile radars were able to measure some of the strongest winds here as it was making that northward turn. So the occlusion process likely started later on as it moved closer to I-40. But, uh, and so that probably likely, likely impacted the deviant motion as well as it moved off closer to I-40. Now this loop here is also interesting as well. This loop was actually a failed dissipation attempt. So it, the tornado began to dissipate, began to broaden out and kind of weaken in its velocities, but something happened and you know there are multiple hypotheses as to why. Perhaps could be something to do with the debris distribution within the tornado, perhaps an occlusion downdraft, and that's you know kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but there could have been some physics going on with the tornado that actually prevented it from dissipating and thus it kind of 
it took a, a, an easterly path again after it did that loop, and then eventually finally dissipated there along I-40 uh, east of El Reno. So very interesting uh, tornado motion there. And some things we can remember for future events. We can always forecast the deviant tornado motion by using the hood graph. It's a very simple technique. You, again, eyeball the average of the low-level winds in the lowest half kilometer or 500 meters of the atmosphere. Look at your observed st storm motion. Bunkers, right mover storm motion will generally do. And you take the average of those. Right in the middle is going to be your deviant storm motion. And you draw a vector from the origin to that point, and that is your deviant tornado motion vector. So a very interesting technique, again, done by Nixon and Allen in their 2021 paper, and that showed that this tornado was likely to turn back toward the northeast pretty significantly, especially after its very stark southerly or southeasterly motion to begin its life cycle. All right, let's take a look at the complex multi-vortex nature of the El Reno tornado, including the interior sub-vortex that impacted both the Weather Channel tornado hunt crew and the Twist X crew ultimately leading to the Twist X crew's deaths. As we've said before, this tornado started off as a you know, strong multi-vortex tornado. You can see from the footage here from Reed Timmer, morphed into a large tornado with the satellite vortex orbiting around it, back to multi-vortex, back to a large tornado with an interior strong sub-vortex. We'll talk about this one in a second. This one was the sub-vortex that impacted the Twist X and Weather Channel crews back to multiple vortices, back to a wedge. So this changed its behavior quite a bit throughout its life cycle. And so let's go ahead and start here. Let's look at this figure from Worman et al. 2014. This just shows how many changes it went through throughout its life cycle. So this was from 2316 or 616 p.m. to 625 p.m. And you can see how many changes it goes through during this time period. The large white circle here is the main parent vortex, the larger tornadic circulation. The small white circles are the interior subvortices. So you can see right here at 2316, 2317, large circulation with just one you know, subvortex there. As it's expanding, about 2319Z, this image is as it was expanding to its you know, you know, uh, two and a half mile plus wide uh, expanse, lots of multiple vortices start to take shape. We start to see a few of those drop off here by 2323, and then we see by 2325 a bunch of different multiple vortices within the main parent circulation. So again, this was a very, very much a shape-shifting tornado throughout its entire life cycle. And this figure from Bluestein et al. 2018 shows how many different subvortices there were. They tracked in their racks pole deployments 24 different subvortices within the main parent circulation. And you can see the tracks here of these subvortices. The green dots are the start of a given subvortex path, and the red dot is the end of that given path. And you can see how many and how quickly they were able to orbit around the parent tornadic circulation here. So pretty astounding tornado. But the one that was most critical and most consequential was this interior subvortex here. And this has some pretty impressive stats behind it. So let's take a look, give some context here. This is the tornado path from NWS Norman again. And both the TWC crew, the Weather Channel crew, and the Twist X crew entered the circulation, the parent circulation from the north side. The Twist X, the TWC crew was moving south on Highway 81 to try to get ahead of it and entered the north side of the circulation. And the Twist X crew was somewhere in here on radio, near Radio and Reuter Roads, and they were moving in toward the north side of the circulation from the west. So that, that is uh, critical because the north side of the circulation, and as we know, it's a very large circulation by this point uh, in this vicinity here. The north side of the circulation, even though it did have quite poor conditions associated with it, those conditions were much better than they were on the south side of the circulation. So even though the you know, visibility and the winds you know, was probably poor, the winds were probably you know, really kicking up here on the north side of the circulation, they were much uh, less volatile than the south side of the circulation. So the, the Weather Channel crew here traveling to the south and the Twist X crew traveling toward the east um, just as that subvortex was orbiting around the main circulation. Here's a figure from Worman et al. 2014 showing the path of that subvortex. The yellow line is the path of that subvortex. The red circles are the main tornadic circulation. So you can see it takes a very erratic sort of path, very couple of, of sort of uh, loops here in its path as it uh, crossed uh, to, to the east of, of Highway 81. And so here is the Samaras vehicle, the red dot here, and here is the path of the subvortex. So right as they were approaching this point, the subvortex completed a loop. 
right there. And there's some pretty you know significant statistics associated with this subvortex here. This vortex was moving along, so its translational speed was 80 meters per second. We'll call that VP as, as it's notated in the Worman et al. 2014 paper. So 80 meters per second. The tr so that's basically how fast the tornado was moving, was translating across the landscape. The tangential speed, so if you were an observer and you were in the tornado at a given point, the wind speed that you would feel at that point would was 60 meters per second. And so these are both additive to give us a 140 meter per second total sort of velocity or V sub G with this tornado. And that is extremely, extremely high. Dow measured you know anything anywhere from 115 meters per second plus anywhere and, and if we make some assumptions about the vortex, 130 to 150 meters per second range. That is 290 to 330 miles per hour. So this is where the um, you know, F, EF5 wind speeds come from, was this single subvortex. So we can see here that the overall speed, given how fast it was moving, plus the overall wind speed in the vortex, translated to something of a 300 mile per hour um, sort of wind velocity that you would experience if you were the twist X vehicle here. So unfortunately, it did a loop, was moving forward at almost 80 meters per second right there, and caught the twist X vehicle off guard, and unfortunately, we know what happened then. Now, there are some drawbacks to these measurements. The first is that the, these measurements by the Doppler on wheels, as noted in the Worman paper, were 100 meters off the ground, 100 meters above ground level. So we don't exactly know what was going on right at the ground level. There could be some frictional effects from the landscape, et cetera, that could have brought those down. And also the translational velocity, uh, both the speed and direction, in relation to where the Dow radar beam Puts, gives some questions about the, um, the validity of the measurement as well. So the orientation of the tornado with respect to the radar beam casts some doubt on the overall measurement. And also, this tornado was moving so fast, this subvortex was moving so fast, again, about 80 meters per second, which is extremely, extremely fast, 170-something miles per hour, which is the fastest ever recorded. Uh, of a again, that's translational speed. How fast the actual vortex is moving across the landscape. It's moving too fast to yield a three-second average, and that three-second average is what is these uh, measurements for wind speeds are based off of. So, if you were saying that this, you know, a certain wind speed is an F EF5 level wind speed, well, you would have to experience that wind speed at a given point for three seconds and average that, the winds at that point for three seconds to come up and validate that wind speed at that given location. Well, because it was moving so fast and covering such a, a great distance in so little time, an observer that was experiencing these um, you know, 60 meter per second wind speeds in the actual tornado and you know, with adding that to the 80 meters per second translational speed, so 140 meter per second, you know, winds you'd feel at a given location in that subvortex, that would only uh, last about a half second at a given location within that vortex. So we're not able to calculate a three second average for a given location in that subvortex. Therefore, that's why you know these measurements are you know not a hundred percent valid as far as saying, oh yeah, this was definitely an EF five. And again, we'll talk about at the end summing this up how you know this was rated an EF three based on damage. The wind speeds here, maybe EF5 level. Well, there are some drawbacks and some caveats to those wind speeds that may take away some validity from those measurements. But nonetheless, this was a, an extremely strong subvortex that impacted the Samaris vehicle, um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, lofted that vehicle, and unfortunately led to their their passing there. So here's another diagram showing the path of that subvortex. You can see the velocity data within the larger circulation. Here's our strong couplet right there. 2323, so 623 p.m. here, it takes goes off toward the north very rapidly, makes that loop right where the Samaris vehicle was, basically deeming it sort of stationary there. And they were likely driving off toward the east, and given the you know, murky visibility and whatnot, they were likely caught off guard by this subvortex, and therefore uh, were uh, caught in its crosshairs. So as far as the Weather Channel vehicle goes, they were, again, caught in the vortex as they were going off to the south on Highway 81. So they were moving south, trying to 
um, get ahead of the vortex. Now at this time, as you can see, it was both expanding and accelerating in its forward speed. So that you know was uh, those were obviously uh, factors that led to this incident with the TWC crew. But this subvortex, this specific subvortex, was the culprit with this crew as well. And you can see from the Mike Bettis video here that actual subvortex right in here, strong subvortex moving right at them very very quickly, and that was the um, sort of same incident with them. They were caught off guard as well as the overall parent circulation expanding uh, and accelerating right as they were crossing through the damage path. So that's kind of how those two situations uh, came about. It was that one interior subvortex that led to um, the incidents with the twist X crew and the um, weather channel crew. Another interesting feature of the El Reno supercell was the fact that it produced a strong anticyclonic tornado that you could actually pick out on the KTLX radar. If we go through our footage, our radar uh, imagery here, so here's the main tornado, we go on with time, and you can see as the gust front starts to take over, the rear flank gust front starts to push out, you can see the, those greens there pushing out, you actually see a small vortex develop off toward the east or southeast of the tornado that does end up being anticyclonic. And it actually was a fairly strong one. Here's some racks poll data of that tornado and you can see a very very well uh, well uh, defined couplet there off to the southeast of the main uh, dissipating tornado and you can see in the rear flank gust front you can see where that gust front is pushing out it's right along the leading edge of that gust front that's the favored location for anti-cyclonic tornado genesis in some of these significant tornado cases but very strong couplet you can see the swirls there in the gust front so lots of eddies along that gust front, this particular one, was able to actually produce a an anticyclonic tornado with debris signature. And interestingly enough, this was likely the first instance of uh, an anticyclonic tornado uh, measured by mobile radar that had multiple vortices. You can see here on this figure from Worman et al. 2014, the multiple vortices within the anticyclonic tornado. So again, just to confirm that this is anticyclonic, the radar's off this way. Here's our velocities image. Inbounds, greens, and blues. Outbounds, those yellows down there, yellows and browns. So our uh, anticyclonic circulation right there was actually multiple vortex. You can see the little sort of couplets there in this uh, main vortex. And so this was a, a pretty groundbreaking uh, data set with this anticyclonic tornado. Also was um, associated with an anticyclonic hook along the leading edge of that gust front. And kind of one last thing here to look at was the progression of the supercell after the El Reno tornado. Of course, we know this was heading right toward the Oklahoma City metro area. So this was a pretty um, pretty uh, harrowing situation for the residents of OKC as this you know, very strong tornado was, was making a beeline for the city. But what actually saved Oklahoma City was the fact that we continued to get storms back building uh, to the west of the main supercell. And that even though we had pretty significant flooding because storms were training over the city for quite some time, as you can see in this radar imagery, uh, we had the tornado threat decrease quite a bit. We did have an, another tornado uh, that was in progress um, on the west side of the Oklahoma City metro area. You can see that it does start to wrap up again there, pretty strong looking hook, strong velocity couple there that did approach the Will Rogers World Airport there in Oklahoma City. But eventually we were able to get this turned from a tornado threat to a flooding threat as these storms kind of congeal. And you can see that we actually got what we call a backbuilding uh, event to happen. And that's been talked about in Bluestein and Jane 1985 as far as a backbuilding MCS. What happens with backbuilding is you get storms to fire. So here's your main storm for say. And you get storms to fire upstream or against the direction of the main uh, steering flow. So if our steering flow is out of the, the west or southwest as it was here aloft, storms are going to form back to the west here. And eventually those are going to probably, you know, get closer to one another, congeal into some sort of MCS. And that's exactly what happened here. And these backbuilding type cases happen in strong shear environments. We can check that box uh, with this case as well. But also we had that extra forcing along the triple point, that dry line and stationary front there right along that triple point was able to uh, provide a continued sort of forcing mechanism along with the strong shear to initiate supercells on the western flanks of the ongoing El Reno supercell to that eventually sort of interfered with the, um, the El Reno storm that would become the Oklahoma City supercell. And eventually you can see it just we continue to get a lot of rain there in the 
perhaps destructive interference in the mesocyclone region of the El Reno to Oklahoma City storm. We've talked about that, that before with storm mergers. You can have constructive interference where you have the storm that merges, like we saw in the initial stages of the El Reno supercell, where we had uh, this storm down here merge with the main supercell and actually increase chances for tornado genesis. Or you can, that's con constructive interference, or you can have destructive interference where you have these storms kind of running into one another and the tornado threat kind of uh, decreases quite a bit. These storms also became pretty outflow dominant with time. Likely a lot of precipitation, a lot of heavy precipitation in the core likely was able to kind of, uh, you know, uh, increase the outflow production with these storms. And you can see the outflow boundary here on radar as we go forward with time there. You can see that boundary, that fine line on reflectivity and that fine line on velocity moving out ahead of the storms, indicating more of an outflow dominant nature to these storms rather than uh, a um, continuation of the tornado threat as they remain inflow dominant. So once again, El Oklahoma City was, was saved pretty much from a pretty significant tornado event uh, because of this kind of backbuilding destructive interference um, and overall uh, sort of... Uh, congealing of these storms into sort of an, a southeastward moving MCS propagating behind that um, cold outflow. So that's going to wrap things up here. This has been, you know, kind of a long uh, sort of discussion, uh, but this was, you know, one of the more notable tornadoes of all time. And so uh, I wanted to do an, uh, as good of a job going in depth with this storm and tornado as I could. Um, you know, once again, you know, just a very unique scenario, very uh, deviant tornado motion. We've, we kind of learned in this video how to forecast that deviant tornado motion. Uh, and this certainly was an environment that produced, uh, was able to produce, uh, was favorable for significant violent tornadoes. And, and we definitely got that from this event. One last thing to touch on, the debate of EF3 versus EF5. Of course, you know, that's the eternal debate with this, um, with this tornado. And we've talked about the caveats with those mobile radar measurements of 300 plus miles per hour winds. Uh, you just, uh, while you know the the mobile radars did measure those very very strong winds comparable with the strongest we've ever seen, you know we do have some caveats that we need to take into consideration. And of course, the Fujita scale is a damage scale. Uh, it's a damage scale that um, you know only takes into account what the tornado hits. And thankfully, this didn't hit a whole lot south of El Reno there. So, you know, that, just keep that in mind. And we are seeing some changes to the Fujita scale uh, that are coming up, adding some more damage indicators for these kind of rural areas, as well as taking into account um, mobile radar data in our assessment of damage ratings. So some exciting changes there. Perhaps they'll you know, retroactively go back and change the rating of this particular tornado. But uh, no doubt, EF3 or EF5, this was one of the strongest tornadoes we've ever seen. And unfortunately, one of the most impactful uh, as far as, um, you know, the deaths of some storm researchers and how many people it impacted uh, out in the field. So thanks for watching, and we will see you in the next video.